Hello friends, welcome to HBAV Classrooms. This is a new series which we are starting uh, majorly to discuss topics and subjects which are less uh, talked about and uh, to present them in relation to our ongoing events or even the subjects which need to have some light thrown upon them. So uh, keeping in mind our current uh, event, Self-Portrait Live, uh, we have uh, decided to bring to you a discussion on the art history part of self-portraits. And this we are going to do in two parts, one which will take care of the uh, and focus on the world uh, history of self-portraits and the other one will be the Indian part of it, the Indian uh, scenario in self-portraits. So today for discussing the world history of self-portraits, we have Professor Vilas Tonape with us. Uh, Professor Vilas Tonape is a well-known artist and uh, he is based in uh, USA and he is a professor at the Methodist University. He has done his bachelor's in fine arts from Sir JJ uh, School of Art in Mumbai and he has earned his MFA from the Texas University in USA. So welcome Professor Vilas Tonape. We are very happy to have you with us. Hello. And, uh, so today, uh, before we start our discussion on you know, the history of self-portraits, it was just uh, like uh, asking you that what a self-portrait seems very obvious, but uh, still I would, uh, for the sake of our viewers, uh, what exactly one means by a self-portrait and how is it done? Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me for this uh, really important subject in art. Um, to me, self-portrait is basically a depiction of yourself, uh, but that's a little simpler definition. Uh, there is more to it. Uh, when we talk about self-portrait or depiction of ourself, uh, there are various purposes are at play. Uh, and not to mention how it got started. You know, it started when we started... Uh, seeing our own reflection, perhaps in water for the first time, and then uh, mirror, and then so on and so forth. And um, and in the beginning, uh, artists used to uh, uh, include their image as an incidental hide, uh, hidden image within a painting, uh, within uh, mostly they were religious painting um, way before. And I think self-portrait, one of the important contribution of self-portrait, I would say, is through self-portrait, the paintings became secular, uh, uh, I mean, for in, in large measure. But anyhow, coming back to uh, what self-portrait means to me and why it has been created, perhaps, uh, there are five elements that I think could be important. One is to sort of advertise your newfound skills, uh, you know, to proclaim, and to show, uh, to announce to the world. Second could be practicing your craft, your skills. Uh, third could be explore and express your inner turmoil. Uh, okay. And and fourth could be you know the vanity element of of it, where uh, you know you are appreciating yourself, uh, good, the bad, the ugly, uh, in in variety of different costume, perhaps you know, or some of your hidden desires. You know, if I want to be a a doctor, I could never be a doctor. So perhaps I can paint myself with the doctor's stethoscope and glow gown and so on and so forth. Um, and, and and of course, the fifth and the last uh, idea of self-portrait could be that artists wants to transmit, transmit an image uh, from here and beyond uh, after after the artist has long gone from, from the planet. So it's for the posterity. It could be one of those reasons as well. Uh, and what could be a better image than the signature image of yourself, where it's not only your art, but also the feature, the model, the the the, the person, the subject is the artist. So that's what I think uh, briefly what, what self-portrait to me is. Uh, so is self-portrait just a depiction of the external uh, look of an artist? Like you uh, did say that uh, it it can represent the desires and uh, 
you know, the background of the artist and all. But uh, how has it evolved over history? You're right. You're right. The self-portrait is, is while, while at a tangible level, it could be a configuration or taking a form of the physicality of oneself. Uh, but the psychological element of human being is also getting processed here, uh, getting depicted in this. Uh, it's almost like a therapeutic element. So you are right. Uh, and, and the evolution, uh, perhaps we can start a slide and I can show a few slides that can kind of draw your attention to uh, visually exactly where the development has begun and how it has evolved from movement to movement and, for, and time history as well. Yeah. So let's share the screen. Uh, hopefully I can do this right. Let's see. Can you see my first screen? Yeah. Slide. Okay, great. Okay, this is this is one of the earliest image where I was talking about incidental and hidden. A lot has been talked about this particular painting. This painting is done by uh, uh, Jan van Eyck, uh, a Baroque artist. Um, he was, uh, if, if you look at in this mirror, there is a self-portrait in here hidden. You can barely tell, but so much has been written about this self-portrait. So artists were utilizing their image somewhere hidden in the painting. Another one that could be more relevant and more uh, uh, clearer would be this one. This is an artist drawing. This is a neoclassical painting by uh, Jacques-Louis David. Um, and, and uh, you see the artist over here in, in the middle just drawing. And that's that corner over there. That's where he okay. is. Okay. So that's how it got started. Um, so this was the urge of uh, being there in process. Uh, means even after the artist is long gone. Correct. Correct. correct, correct. They this, want to be this, part this, of the painting. It's almost like a signature, you know. Okay. Uh, but instead of actual name you you go a little more than that because of a couple of things because of the new skills uh, the new invention of mirror and so on and so forth so it's almost like utilizing that new technology loosely put to add yourself into that painting okay. uh, and these two paintings exemplify there are thousands of paintings like that i've just used of course two examples here mm -hmm. so and it, go, it goes beyond too, um, you know, if I were to continue uh, the evolution, talking about the evolution, this one is a famous artist, Caravaggio. Um, he used his self-portrait for his subjects. Some of it uh, uh, secular, some of it is religious paintings, uh, you know, but the secular paintings were beginning to take place. Uh, when I say secular, I'm talking about the paintings of self-portrait where it has nothing to do with the religion or the subject. The subject was just yourself. But here, that's probably not the case. There is a story about this painting. Uh, we won't get into detail about that, but... Uh, uh, artists did utilize their self as an image to communicate a narrative story in a painting. And this is one of the good example of that. Okay. Uh, and then at some point we were talking about secular painting. Um, uh, the, the, the depiction of, of yourself became like a central theme in, in a painting. And this is a very good example of one of the earliest artists, Albrecht Durer. Uh, mm -hmm. a Northern Renaissance artist. Um, and this particular painting is very well admired uh, and it's in the annals of history, it's it's revered uh, deeply. Um, particularly, particularly there is a resemblance of this artist, the, this uh, image with, uh, with, the, with the Christ. Yes. It's very allegorical. This painting is very allog allegorical in that context. And the funny thing is here, the inscription, if you see it's in Latin, it says, I, Albrecht Durer of Nuremberg, portrayed myself in appropriate colors, age 28. It says right there on the right side, upper right side. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I particularly mention about that inscription because the next slide will have something to do with that inscription. But yeah, this is one of the uh, important artists and this painting uh, when it comes to self-portrait. Okay. 
So uh, it is uh, Albert uh, Durer. He is uh, one of the first person to have done a self portrait. He is one or... of the earliest. Exactly, it's it will be difficult to difficult to tell exactly who it was. Some things, some things there ha there has been record of certain things, but it's it's not for certain things the record has not been there. Because uh, we are going back, you know, a few hundreds of years. This one is uh, around, what, uh, 500 years, over 500 years. Uh, so the record keeping the way we it exists now, it wasn't obviously at the time. Uh, so the in fact, some of, in fact, we have an artist, we'll, we'll see next there um, after this, who has multiple different dates for her death. Okay. Different, yeah. So what I'm trying to say is the record keeping was not so uh, efficient at the time, uh, unless unless the person becomes important and and somebody has an interest in in his biographical research, it will be difficult to find the accurate uh, record. So by that rationale, I would say he's one of the earliest one. Now he was he the first one to do the self portrait. Uh, it's difficult to tell uh, um, exactly but very earliest one and certainly he is an important one and made self-portrait very famous he was oh. um, but there are some art or some artists where some research has uh, done some research enough to certainly say these are the facts uh, they have research enough to get to the facts. Like this particular artist, um, Katerina Van Hamerson, she was the first one. Now there is a record of that. He was she was the first one to do a self portrait with an easel. Okay. Not just a first female, first artist period, male or female. Um, and and interestingly enough, this one was painted at the age of twenty. And the inscription says just that I, Katerina Van Hamerson, have painted myself um, 1548 at mm -hmm. the age of 20. Right there, it says on the upper left hand corner. Now, the reason I mentioned that, remember earlier slide, I, I talked about Albrecht Durer's uh, inscription over there. She admired Albrecht Durer very much. So I wonder if there is any similarity or inspiration from Albert Durer's self-portrait. Um, okay. Because another element is Durer's painting is very much about Christ or allegorically about Christ. And here at one hand, you might say it's not allegorical or has anything to do. It's very secular painting. But at the same time, you see she's holding a brush and a mall stick. Mall stick is when you use a, a little um, support to rest your palm while you're painting. And, mm -hmm. and if you add the uh, mall stick and the brush, it creates a cross. So I don't yeah. know if that was intended to be a cross or it is, is it meant to be allegorical uh, with, with, with a theme of uh, Bible? I don't know, but uh, there could be some connection, but certainly there is an inscription over there very much like Albert Durer's. Yeah. Um, you want to say something about this or should I move to next? Uh, like uh, I also have read about this artist and uh, as uh, she's the first one to show uh, herself with the easel, I believe uh, uh, women were not allowed to paint uh, or uh, sign their own uh, artwork. Yes. It was supposed to be a male profession. So yeah. I think she was one of the first artists to be able to sign her own artwork. And here she's also proclaiming herself, her identity as an artist. Right, right. Yeah. It's it's unfortunate, but that is true. Uh, and uh, hats off to uh, his her father. This was going back 600 years, uh, 500, 600 years, when her father saw her talent and encouraged her to paint. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, he was he would just encourage her just like you know any other uh, if if he had a, a a male child it didn't matter to her and it kind of reminded me of that movie uh, dangal uh, yeah. my, it, you know that where he said it doesn't matter if my if my daughters uh, can uh, do the dangal or not do the dangal uh, male or female it doesn't matter uh, medal yeah. to medal hota hai that's what he said 
Uh, I think that that says a lot about her upbringing, that that bold background that her father encouraged, go ahead and paint. So yeah, you're right. True. Uh, this one is Joseph Wright of Derby uh, painting. Um, he was an important artist because he was uh, one of the first one who expressed the spirit of industrial rev revolution. Uh, and this particular painting is very well liked, uh, particularly the way he has, he, his chiaroscuro is kind of soft over here. And, yes. and the gaze and the, his, his gesture re resting his hand on the on the chin is very warm, inviting, and welcoming. Um, and and notice here now everything else took a back seat except the artist. Uh, the artist has worn his favorite clothes, perhaps a favorite hat or a scarf or bandana, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. So artist has become very important here in terms of his features or eyes or structure or gesture or pose. Everything else took a backseat. Um, and in that regard, he was an important, he did like uh, not too many, seven or eight portraits, but he was in historical context, kind of an important artist in terms of industrial revolution. Okay. Um. And now we talked about talk about specific golden uh, age, the Dutch golden age of painting. Now, as 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 strange as as it may be, during the Dutch uh, period, uh, Baroque period particularly, self portrait was very much in demand. It was uh, people would paint self portrait, and churches and other collectors would buy self portrait of other artists. Uh, despite yeah. it may not be their own self-portrait, there was a demand for it. Uh, Johannes Vermeer, who's more famous for Girl with the Pearl Earring painting, this is his self-portrait. The only reason I, I got this painting to show you is not only about his skills, but just to point out, he was a very slow painter. There is a technique called underpainting of, uh, called Grisaille, underpainting before you put the saturated hues. And okay. Johannes Vermeer was very notoriously slow in that. He would probably paint like one month at least to just do the brown painting, the grisaille, before he put the saturated hues. Anyhow, this is one of his uh, self-portrait from that period. Love it. And of course, the great master, you know, uh, Rembrandt, an innovative and prolific painter. Um, on the left one, the interesting thing about the left, on the left one, both seem to be highly skilled, but on the left one, it's such an interesting and beautiful painting, but this was not, he, he, Rembra was not yet became an important artist. He was yet to move to Amsterdam. He was yet to be well known. He was yet to polish his art. He was yet to make a name for himself. You know, uh, he was yet to be known in art circles. Uh, mm -hmm. on the left one and on the right one it was at the age of 49 when he was well known uh, and and uh, speaking of speaking of uh, secular and religious painting um, I mean if you see the painting on the left is very secular and on the right um, if you don't know the history or a story about the painting uh, you might not realize it's a very religious painting he has portrayed himself as a as a, a Saint Paul okay uh, awesome. Uh, Saint uh, Apostle Paul, and and in um, and and um, the the book that is holding it has Hebrew letters. Hebrew is almost like a Sanskrit in the context of Indian, you know. Scan okay. If you see a Sanskrit book, it's probably something religious. You would assume. Um, so in Hebrew culture, uh, Saint Paul was a very important figure. So he's uh, Rembra is kind of portraying himself as as. Same, but again, going back to is this uh, because he's trying to communicate his faith, uh, his religious background, or is he trying to make himself uh, living beyond uh, the point that he's gone from the earth because he is thinking religion will always be relevant? So I don't know. Um, his use of light is amazing. Yeah, I mean, Rembrandt is a master. I mean, I may have a couple of more paintings 
yeah, here are a couple of more paintings of, he has done, he was probably, probably the most amount of self-portrait anybody has probably done, uh, depending on which source you're reading, uh, probably done is probably uh, Rembrandt. I mean, he, uh, like I said, you know, one of the thing is practice um, your skill and, um, and, and also easily available model. Another thing that's important about self-quoted is, I don't know if we touched upon this earlier, when you practice your own art in your studio with your own self, it's, it's probably the safest haven or safest place where you can experiment. Now I know that because from my own experience, even when I hire a model who I pay, who I pay. So it doesn't matter if my painting is good or bad. I still somewhere, either consciously or subconsciously, I feel that the model should not hate my painting. It should be reasonably good enough. So there is that little tiny bit nervousness at the back of my mind is always there. But in self-portrait, there is absolutely no fear because you are, you are it. So it's the safest place where I can experiment. If I want to add some bold stroke, I can take that. Even if it's a mistake, I'll throw the painting away or it'll be an unsuccessful painting, but I don't have uh, another human being, another person in the studio where I could be embarrassed or any such thing, right? So that's also another reason why self-portrait is, is, is a good idea, you know, to practice. Uh, a little bit elaborated description of all those three elements, uh, five elements that we talked about in terms of self purpose of self-portrait. Mm -hmm. Moving on, I found this artist, uh, Lebrun, Louise VJ Lebrun, uh, on the right side. Uh, she was a she was an amazing artist. Uh, wh what is important about her self portrait is she would do a lot of self portrait to communicate uh, two or three things. It's almost like a promotion, is what she did. Number one. It's almost like a business card uh, element here. She would do self-portrait and exhibit and show people to show that she can do this. Okay. She can have that commission. So almost like it's an example. Here's my business card. Uh, and second reason she also did self-portrait and it particularly on her self-portrait, you will see she is very elaborately, fancily dressed. Mm -hmm. What that shows is, or what she was trying to communicate is, see how successful I am. You will not be able to tell from her, uh, the clothes she's wearing, that she is a starving artist. You will definitely not be able to uh, say that. Because just the hat and the fence. What? She looks a successful artist. Correct, correct, and and that's what she's trying to communicate through this painting. And the and and also incidentally, on the left side, there is a painting of uh, Peter Paul Rubens, the great Peter Paul Rubens. Um, she was an admirer of uh, Rubens's paintings, and uh, particularly this uh, painting of uh, Rubens painting. I think his sister-in-law. Um, and uh, you can see some similarities over there with the hat and the sky and Rubens's painting, I think has a little bit darker sky, uh, but she was a, she was an admirer of Peter Paul Rubens. And this is one of her favorite painting of Rubens. Okay. Interestingly, then as we move further in the history of self-portrait, you will also see a variety of different ideas how people paint. Now, the idea of using palette, the idea of having easel included was new at the time. But here is an artist, uh, Georg Demaris. Georg Demaris, he used his uh, daughter as in, in his self-portrait. That's him painting, but that lady is his daughter. So that's also an interesting take on self-portrait. So you can have a concept that is not religious, but very personal. Yeah. Person, secular, but at the same time, personal. Uh, and, and nothing can be more personal than having your family member, your daughter or your child in a painting with you. Uh, and that's what uh, you see here. And it's an incredible painting, no doubt. Uh, he was a Swedish painter, you know, a son of an immigrant. Um, he actually uh, uh, was instructed by his own relatives in art, in drawing and painting and all that. But that's a longer story. Um, 
but that, that's really a wonderful painting. If you see all the elements over there, brushes and the rag and some writing over there, uh, and, and uh, his daughter is holding a palette. So it it that also shows his relationship with his daughter. So she's not just standing over there. An artist having somebody touch the palette or hold a palette or a brush. Now I know that I didn't I didn't read it, but simply from my perspective, being an artist myself, uh, I would not let anybody hold my palette or touch my palette or my brushes if there is no trust and love in that relationship. So that communicates okay. that to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's another artist uh, with an incredible skills, um, Marie Gabrielle Capet, a French neoclassical painter. Uh, there's not much information available uh, about her. She came from a very modest background, but I wanted to show this slide that in terms of practic practicing your art and, and um, proclaiming or advertising your skills, just look at the way this particular piece is painted. It's just incredible. Um, yeah. The textures and the fabric. Oof. Yeah, the fabric. Yeah, that's why I put a little close up of that too. Unfortunately, there's not much uh, known about her earlier life. Uh, she attended public drawing school, public school uh, for drawing that was close to her town. Um, but but um, uh, this particular painting is just takes your breath away, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, then we get to uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. Uh, uh, speaking of processing your inner turmoil, this Baroque artist could be a good example of that. An extreme okay. like, example that will oh, say what? I just said, okay. Yeah, because um, uh, there are three cell portraits I have over here. Uh, if, if you see the painting where she is uh, uh, portrayed as a lute player, so it's probably one of her desire to be a musician. She actually did play a little bit, not much, a little bit lewd, but it, it's a, it's like a little fancy, a fantasy a person may have. Like I said earlier, you know, if I wanted to be a lawyer and I could never become a lawyer, so maybe I can wear a lawyer's clothing and do a self-portrait just to sort of uh, entertain myself or humor myself. You know, yeah. it's the hidden desire processing how I look in a lawyer's uh, robe, the black robe, the black coat. And on the bottom one, uh, the painting that that has a little wheel, broken wheel, the broken wheel has uh, uh, Saint Catherine in Bible has uh, is been uh, tortured through that wheel. So there is a story about that torture. So she used that wheel to express her personal feeling or personal anguish or personal struggle that she had to go through. She was uh, raped at an early age. Um, and and um, uh, uh, the the family uh, sort of did a little uh, little ceremony, and and it was decided that uh, the person who raped her and she will get married. And after seven or eight months, the 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 man refused to marry her, and that's when they filed uh, a case against him. And the kind of questions she was asked. Uh, uh, in the court and so it was really tough on her and uh, unfortunately at the time she was she became more famous for this trial and the rape case rather than her skills so that could be one of the way that self-portrait is you getting utilized that subject is utilized like a therapy okay and um to move on a little bit little bit further this is this is one movement just before um, impressionism. Um, this artist is Gustav Corbe is a very important, it's highly high regarded artist in the developments of cubism and impressionism after him. He was, uh, he did a lot of uh, realistic painting like Stonebreakers and uh, Burial at the Ornans. There are a few more shell, uh, few more important paintings, famous paintings of his that if you see, you will recognize that painting. Uh, not so much maybe this self-portrait, but the reason I wanted to show this painting was it's very unusual in terms of both hands are part of painting and the expression and the light, very unusual. It's almost like a caricature he was doing. 
And incidentally, the caricature art was beginning to take place. Daumier is an artist, contemporary of Gustav Corbe, who was a pioneer, based on whatever record we have, but was a pioneer of caricature art. Remember the Vyanga Chitra that uh, R.K. Lakshman used to do uh, in, in newspapers and all that? It was around this time it was developed. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I'm not saying he was the one, but somewhere you can see that element of caricature in his self-portrait, technically speaking. So that's why I wanted to show this slide. Okay. Now we come to pure Renaissance, excuse me, uh, Impressionism. Right after realism came Impressionism, where you know you have Monet, Renoir, Van Gogh, post-Impressionism, uh, uh, Sira, uh, Pizarro, uh, Sicily, all these, all these great many art Degas. Let's not forget Degas. Uh, but this one is particularly a, a great painting of Renoir, uh, of from 1870. It's one of the earliest painting, and uh, he was so kicked. He was so. Um, happy about this particular painting, but because one um, art collector saw this painting and went crazy for this painting and he bought that painting and and Renoir was so so kicked about this, you know, he was so happy and he kept telling people that, you know, this collector went crazy for my painting, went crazy for my painting, you know. Um, so that's one of the painting. I mean, technically you see there is a shift in rendering. How, so as we see the cell body, you can see technically it was getting challenged too, uh, subject-wise, content-wise as well. You know, we started with the religious painting, then hidden images, then paintings became secular, self-portraits become secular, then very personal, personal subjects, then personal anguish and desire and so on and so forth. And now you can see there is a shift in technique, how the realism has been treated. Mm. Uh, how the, the color application also is uh, very unlike the earlier paintings. Correct, correct, correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, look at the structure of the nose. Uh, Renoir was an amazing painter, but it, it here, what was important was that structure, that rendering. Look at the ear. If you look at the ear, you can barely tell what it is. It's just the medium took a little bit front seat. The medium and the application became important. And that's what Impressionism is all about. We can talk more about it when we get to it, or if we ever get to it, that's a different story. But here you can see the grammar of painting versus the medium. The medium seems to be important. Let's look at another one. This is Manet's self-portrait here. Again, the same thing. The medium it became more important rather than the structure and the eyes and the details. Mm -hmm. uh, but not so far away that it almost looks like such a abstract technique or abstract application that you can't even tell it's a portrait. Correct. That's going too far, you know. And we and we probably are getting there uh, in in time in a, in a moment here. But uh, here you will see, despite the application and the freedom of application or the media, you can still see it's a portrait and the likeness and, and uh, you know, structure, vague structure. So that's that's Manet, um, an important Impressionist artist. He was part of both movements, actually, realism as well as Impressionism. Some of his earlier paintings was very much like Gustave Courbet, a real, a real uh, representational or uh, realistic uh, depiction rendering. We move to uh, Paul Gauguin. Uh, Gauguin, who was originally uh, a stockbroker, uh, formally trained as a stockbroker rather than painting. Um, you have any questions so far, Hina? No, I'm just following. Yeah. I will ask you. Okay. So, um, I'm just thinking, looking at both these, that the rendering of both the works are pretty different. Correct, correct. And and there is a story about that. The reason is uh, the one on the right was was painted a little earlier, clearly. And one on the left was painted a little later, a few years later. Um, if I were to say which one is more realistic, traditionally speaking, realistic, I would say the one earlier one, the right one. Mm -hmm. The left one, there is a there is a there is a concept called cloisonism. Okay. Cloisonism, where um, basically the decorative element of any shape. The flatten the flatness of a shape becomes very important, as if it's a decoration. Yeah, it's more stylized. Say what? 
more stylized stylized yeah stylized uh, so that 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 thing is called cloisonism um and it's attributed to gogans who later work especially uh, uh, as well as um, when he went to tahiri uh, and that's where he did all those works of the tahitian ladies and many of them were very much cloisonism um so yeah, the colors also were not real yeah he the what he the colors were not uh, yeah they were exaggerated they were exaggerated uh, again again if you see the trend here uh, the application was getting challenged the realism was getting challenged every art movement is kind of a reaction to its previous movement Yeah. Uh, if everything was fine with the old style television, why would we invent plasma TV? Because it was not fine. While yeah. we appreciated the old televisions, the channel changer and all that, it was good, but it was yeah. not enough. The progress has to happen. Progress is a way of life, way of universe. You know, universe is also expanding, um, as as uh, they say in astronomy. Uh, but yeah, here realism has taken back seat. You know, the design element has taken a front seat. you know okay. um then we talk about the the great vincent mango mm-hmm. uh, or uh who who has went through so much uh, you know uh, uh, situations and problems in his life he at one point he and gogan used to paint together vango invited uh, in Mar- marcia he invited uh, gogan to come and paint with him and they had a little fight and uh, once he took a uh knife to kill gogan and uh, anyhow so he cut his yeah. hair it's a famous story he cut his hair and he did a lot of paintings up uh, you know of of himself uh, before he cut his hair but as well as when he was you know uh, in in a in a bandaid for the year situation he did he did uh, a lot of self portraits and it could be looked upon as a little bit a way of a therapy you know processing his pain or hurt or whatever he went through cutting his ear or psychological issues but the difference here you will see uh, along with the process along with processing his inner turmoil or inner demons you see the difference between left portrait and the right portrait the left portrait seems to be a little bit more painful the right one seems a little bit more luxurious just by the fact the smoke and the pipe uh, nobody tend to nobody t- it, it won't be it won't be sensible to portray a uh, pain with a pipe and smoke so it's very much like a luxury element that has been con- communicated here um so that that's these are two g- great paintings actually of uh, of van gogh but notice van gogh technique is also getting challenged over here see the bold strokes technique is getting challenged realism is getting challenged and the hues i mean hues are becoming brighter and brighter there is a greater acknowledge of hue for the sake of hue if yeah. you look at old master painting the hues were bright over there too but the hues at some point merely communicated that object here mm-hmm. here you see pay attention to all the post impressionist art even bef- one before that this one too where you will see the hue they are trying to communicate the power of hue by itself as well without sure. its identity of uh, of the object um here's another artist not well known now uh, henry russo he was a post impressionist artist the uh, unfortunately the uh, uh, critics at the time were not not uh, nice to him were not pleasant to him um, he was always bashed down as a hobby artist but the funniest thing about this is um this may come as a shock to us uh in this time and age but at the time even the old canvases used to get sold uh, on the street what that means is if uh, the old like a like a like a um, uh, thrift store thrift store kya bolte ho india mein uh, yeah i get it uh, yeah so on the street they would sell like a like a street shops you know on the street they will sell old canvases jisko art pravari and that kind of stuff correct yeah 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 right 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 kabar kabar khana whatever that that word is um uh yeah, store bazaar <laughs> right right exactly exactly so the idea was they are not selling the painting they were selling can- canvases which is already painted upon that they would 
you could paint white on it or do another painting on it. So they are selling it just for artists to utilize for a newer painting. So one of the painting that uh, Picasso saw on the street, bought that canvas, and he went to see him because he was so impressed with his art. Imagine that. Of all the people, Picasso did that. Okay. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing. But yeah, here you can see his cell portrait here, and uh, uh, you can see you can see him a little bit isolated than the main the Paris the Eiffel Tower over here. I think that's what this communicates uh, to me that he is a little bit uh, sidestepped by the art um, camaraderie of 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 the Paris art scene. Okay. His composition is also very unusual. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Composition also very unusual, but it's a great painting, and and uh, he's been he's been in museums, and of course, you know, he's a part of uh, art history now, an important part of art history. Um, and then we come to Father of Modern Art. Um, I wanted to show this particular piece because for two reasons, this particular piece was not so kindly received by the public at the time. Sounds mm -hmm. blasphemy, but that's Paul Cezanne for you. I mean, it's the great master. He was, he's considered father of modern art. Uh, Picasso used to idolize him. He was much senior artist than Picasso. Uh, when Picasso went to Paris, uh, he would just look at Toulouse, -Lutrec. he would hunt down Toulouse Lutrec's painting and Cezanne's painting. He was so fascinated by these two artists. Um, and and uh, if you look at later paintings of Cezanne, you will see some of the elements of cubism in his painting. So it is it is majority of the art scholars and critics and art historians have acknowledged the fact that uh, Cezanne paved the way for cubism. He didn't fully do the cubism, but he paved. You can see some senses of cubism in his later paintings towards the end, some landscapes, if you will. But anyhow, coming back to his self-portrait, this one is not well received because um, this was considered very a low spirited painting. Uh, there is nothing much in this painting. The he's just standing. There is no expression. There is no. It was basically there was no fun in this painting. That's how it was looked upon. I'm not saying that was that's how it was looked upon. I would never say that about Cezanne's work. I don't don't care what he does. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's that's how. Uh, it is. But I I wanted people to see that you know uh, that not every painting has to be successful, you know. Mm -hmm. You I I keep the, uh, send, uh, uh, giving this example. You know, um, um, Steven Spielberg was nominated for best director six or seven times, but he didn't make six or seven movies. He made probably 30, 40 movies. He's making movies since seventies. But not every piece will be nominated for Oscars, you know, but but it's important to keep going. It's important to keep going. Uh, but here but you can see maybe... The gaze, if we notice the gaze, it is, I think, a typical look one has when observing oneself in a mirror. And so I think most uh, self-portraits have that sense of seriousness or somebody uh, contemplating and introspecting kind of look. Correct, correct. Correct. There are some paintings I should have pointed out earlier. There are some paintings that we we skip through uh, that we we saw where the gaze is not just directly at you, but the gaze is beyond you to the audience uh, mm -hmm. in self portrait within self portrait. So that's that's kind of important too, where the artist is looking uh, is shown, you know. But here the yeah, you're right. It's it's a very much like uh, introspection look he possess. And here's a couple of quotes, uh, what uh, Picasso said about Cezanne. Cezanne. Cezanne was the father of all of us. That's what he, he said. And Henry mm -hmm. Matisse said about Cezanne is a kind of dear god of painting. Okay. Uh, it's like how we say god of cricket is Sachin Tendulkar. So the god of painting is, uh, is Cezanne is what Matisse said. I'm not saying it. Uh, mm -hmm. So... And then, then we get to the modern master, uh, the Spaniard, Mr. Picasso, yeah. uh, the great Picasso. So this is uh, this is actually a, a blue period self-portrait. It's a very low period in his life uh, because he was going through a lot of his his uh, his uh, one of his friend killed himself. Casagamas uh, 
um, and, and many other things. He was struggling in Paris with cold and starving artists and all that jazz uh, at mm -hmm. the time. And this is one of his earlier paintings, uh, where it, uh, earlier phase rather, you know, it was called, it's called as blue period, where all paintings are blue, gloomy, uh, you know. Now we come to the pioneer of abstract art. Mm -hmm. And that's why exactly the reason why this particular self-portrait or this artist is important in this context. Uh, you Ordinarily, you would think he was a pioneer of abstract art. Why would he have a portrait and then mm -hmm. self-portrait? But that's, this is an example of that, you know? Um, but I was showing this slide to students once and talking about this and a student pointed out to me that she said, but you see the background very much like an abstract. There is an element of abstract. So I, I think that's interesting to note because somewhere that innate tendency of abstraction, maybe you cannot move out of that, you know, when it's part of you. It's, it's like asking Sachin Tendulkar, do a bad batting. It's, it's not possible. He cannot do that, you know. Uh, this is become part of your DNA. So there is somewhere that abstract element is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, and and colors, uh, you know, are different. And colors are very much like fauvism. We'll talk about that in a minute, uh, what fauvism is and Matisse and Andre, uh, um, Rene Magritte did, uh, Andre Durain did. Um, and we are right there, fauvism. Fauvism was basically a movement that was pioneered by Matisse and André Durain in, in Paris. And um, uh, by the way, incidentally, Matisse was very well respected by Picasso um, and, and the art circle at, at the time too. He was senior artists, all well respected. He did, I think, three or four, four self-portraits. And three of them are in front of mirror, uh, I mean, uh, in front of the easel, uh, showing him painting or doing something with the easel. And only one painting which does not have that art setup, and okay. this uh, this with the striped shirt is t shirt is is the one of that is okay. the is that one, um, and 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 uh, the idea of Fauvism was they were challenging uh, the elements of value and the hue, uh, the Fauvism. Fauvism means fau, wild beast. The colors were very wild. Um, as in, if they see a, a gray, a middle tone, so they would say, what color will that be? You see, so it's it's all about hues, purer hues, rather than just tones or grayed down tones. So, um, and I think this, uh, both the paintings are good, but the one on the right side, the big one, it's an exquisite uh, piece. Uh, the application, the composition, uh, and the colors, you have to look at that in the context of Fauvism. Uh, a lot of complementaries used. Say what? A lot of complementaries used. Correct, correct. Compl yeah, a lot of complementary use. Yeah. Um, another way to explain this is, you know, uh, sometimes students ask me, but there is no realistic representation and this and that, you know, it's not really properly. That. You have to look in the context. It's if you are looking at a Smita Patil's movie for, directed by Sham Benegal and you are expecting a, a Himmatwala dance like Jitinder and Sri Devi, that's not mm -hmm. a right expectation because that's not the movie where you should expect that. Sham Benegal, when makes a movie with Smita Patil, he has different elements in that versus Himmatwala with Jaya Prada and Sri Devi and Jitinder. You see my point? So it's a two different. Uh, uh, and then when you see Himatwala, don't expect Sham Benegal's, uh, you know, treatment over there, you know, vice versa. It goes both ways. Um, so. And then when we, it come, we come to Picasso again, he did this at the age of 91. Um, wow. Yeah, he was, he died at the age of 92. Um, and, and uh, the, um, the rec official record is even the day he died, at 92, that very day he was he was drawing. He okay. was doing art. Uh, incredible, I mean. But anyhow, the interesting thing over here now, we move to self-portrait facing death. Mm. How, how gloomy is that? A certain amount of fear also. 
yeah, yeah, of fear and and very gloomy, you know. Um, so it's it's I guess it's in a way you are also expressing things that are happening to you. Mm. You know, going back to Artemisia Gentileschi, you know, Correct. not just public, you know, even the nature, the nature. I mean, you're supposed to get old and you will get old at some point and, and that's nature doing, gravity doing to you. And It's like what is preoccupying his mind, like the correct. fear of uh, facing death. Correct, correct, correct. It could be that or it could be he's trying to be confident that I'm going to face death head on without any fear. Mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be both. It not necessarily is a gloomy one. It yeah, but there, it definitely looks like fear to me. Correct, correct, than... correct, correct, correct. Uh, I mean, what I'm saying is, artist has a way of processing or using it as a therapy, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and there may be layers of therapy. What he's maybe part of it is fear, part of it is confident, part of it is I want to face it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe layers of it. I don't know. Uh, but these are important paintings of an important artist. You know. The most exciting thing ever happened in 20th century in art was cubism. And this man was an inventor of cubism. And now we come to German expressionist, uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, German expressionist. Uh, what do we see here? Um, he was an important part of the bridge group, uh, Die, Die Bruch, uh, how it's called in German. In German. Um, there was a group of artists, uh, Yulansky, Kandinsky, um, Paul Clay, and Krishner. They were all German expressionists and part of a group at Dybruck. There were two groups, like Dybruck and, the, uh, and uh, the Blue Rider, two different groups, but they were part of German expressionism. But anyhow, coming back to self-portrait, here you see he's dressed as a, this was around the time of World War I. And, and what do you see? He's dressed as a soldier. And his one of his arm is amputated. Okay. So maybe he's making a statement about the zeitgeist. What is the social situation at the time? So that could be also part of your self-portrait where you express what's happening around the world in your painting. So here, I mean, he never had his hand amputated or anything. So it no, was no. just a fear Correct. again. Correct. Of losing his hand. Correct. In, perhaps in the war. Okay. But that's just the thing, you know. N notice one shift also happened. Um, uh, if you look at how we started in the beginning and how we have arrived here, one of the thing, one theme you should notice, uh, we didn't really talk about that, but the visual, the realistic visual rendering kind of increasingly started going in the background. Okay. It was right in the forefront in the beginning. If you remember Gentileschi yeah. or Baroque painting or Rembrandt, very realistic. Here, it's not realistic. Because mm. why did that happen? Because somewhere, if you draw realistic, mm. your mind, the thought-provoking aspect will take the back seat and you will start admiring very much about, oh, look at the technique, how he has painted the cigarette or the arm or the eyes. That will that admiration will always be there. Maybe artists at the time does not want audience to acknowledge that exquisite skills, mm -hmm. but instead pay attention to what it is communicating, the content of it. Correct. Ah, now we come to uh, Salvador Dali. Another another uh, eccentric Spaniard. Um, when I say another, I mean the first one being Picasso. He's the he's the father of eccentricity of all. Uh, but the second one would be Dali. Um, there are two self portraits here of Dali. Left one is realism. The right one is cubism. The right side he did for a very small. Uh, period, uh, short period, he did uh, cubism paintings because cubism was was the tender of the day at the time in, in Europe, uh, started by Picasso and Braque. Uh, 
so he did a few paintings in that style, but he was most comfortable with surrealism because surrealism offered him uh, that opportunity to paint things realistically. Now, if you look at uh, the one on the left, titled "Cell Ported with Grilled Iron," a uh, grilled bacon. Uh, Despite it is distorted figure, but there is a scope of realistic rendering there. There is there is something very realistic. The creature may be not realistic. Let's say let's say this person is an alien person, but the rendering is very realistic. Where on the right side, cubism, mm -hmm. which challenged the how artists were viewed or treated the space and three dimensionality and two dimensionality and the planes, it cubism challenged everything about art the planes and the organization of play, the composition. So you see that, but there is not scope of realistic rendering or realistic uh, painting, uh, express things in realism, realistically. That scope is not there in cubism, but that scope is there in, in, in surrealism. So that's why he was most comfortable with that. And this particular piece kind of actually relates to Sistine Chapel, uh, Michelangelo is holding a little hide um, of of a skin of a of a of an animal, so he used that as a reference to communicate here. Despite basically, he was trying to say, despite you say the heart is important, the emotion is important. He was saying there is a, a, a validity to what you see on the skin. So he was acknowledging, okay. you know. Um, another artist here is of surrealism is Rene Magritte. Um, as strange as it may sound, this one is not a surrealism painting. Um, this one is cubism painting, a cubist painting. Um, but for some strange reason, uh, Rene Magritte, who was a surrealist artist, he did his self portrait in technically in the fashion of cubism. Um, yeah. and and this is one of that painting. Uh, where and I, earlier I was talking about cubism just challenged everything. This is a very good example of that. How the space was challenged by cubism. I mean, you can still see a human being and maybe even likeness. I don't know what uh, uh, Rene Magritte looked like, but the point is it challenged. You see how the nose is painting, eyes is painting, where is the structure? It has its own anatomy, the cubism. It has its own structure. Um, the, so the traditional... Uh, valuation of all the classical element was challenged here in a very, very strange manner and very pleasant manner, if you will, a provoking pleasant manner. So that you see in this cell portrait here by Rene Magritte. Magritte was an important artist in that regard. You will, you will, if you see some of his surrealism painting, you will know who that is because he's very famous for some of his surreal painting. Um, but this particular painting is not so famous of his. Uh, uh, another important artist from that period, uh, German Expressionist, is Paul Klee, surrealist German Expressionist painter, uh, modern artist. Uh, and this is his self-portrait uh, in watercolors, what ink and watercolors. Um, again, um, see how one can express. Here, the eyes are closed or eyes don't exist. Is there some kind of element of his life he's trying to express? Uh, a Swiss-born German artist. Um, he had a very highly individualized style um, from, you know, in his paintings. And, and this is very much reminiscent of, of um, his style. Would it be like a meditative look? It could be. It could be. It's almost like, yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, because another thing that is interesting or kind of, kind of resonate to what you're saying is, his hands, feet, and everything, not even shoulders are there. Mm -hmm. Isn't that one of the element of meditation where you really uh, sacrifice or don't think about anything, all your limbs, limbs meaning metaphorically speaking, you are an artist, you are a human being, you are this, you are a, you are a millionaire, you are rich, you are a professor, you are an artist, you are this, you are that. Aren't you in the meditation? You're supposed to tag all that, you know, you let go of all of those attachments. And I think that is getting communicated by the fact 
that is eyes closed and there is no limbs, nothing shown, not even shoulders. That's very unusual, not even having shoulders. So it's almost like he's purely just an Atma or a being or a soul. Uh, somewhere, I think that might be the, the interpretation uh, for this. We get to um, the great one of the great female artists, one of my favorite actually, Frida Kahlo, uh, Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. Um, you see how artists may work, uh, you, you know, use using iconography and symbology um, to to process your personal things that you are going through in life. Like the one on the left is very symbolic. I would say, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to read something over here. The cat is a, a cat is symbol symbolic of good good luck in in Mexican culture, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the monkey is a symbol of uh, evil, particularly how the monkey is holding her necklace, a necklace of thorns, mm -hmm. and, and pushing. This was a time when she was going through some relationship aspect with the famous artist Diego Rivera, another famous Mexican artist. She was married to him. She was, he was, I think, 14 or 15 years older than him. I, I may be incorrect with the exact number, but a very senior artist, and she was very young. And so they, their relationship was not a typical love story. They, they had a very um, um, up and down kind of relationship, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the roller coaster ride uh, kind of relationship they had, and uh, the the monkey was gifted to her by uh, Diego Rivera. She was married and then divorced him, and a year or two later, they married again. So you can see what I mean by roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Literally a roller coaster kind of relationship. Uh, so on the on the left, maybe she's processing all those elements. You know, um, uh, maybe maybe she the the fact that it's a thorn uh, necklace, which is kind of uh, reminiscent of the crown of uh, Christ, and Christ was a uh, was a martyr, right? And she was maybe trying to process that or uh, using that that iconography of of uh, Jesus. Christ into her own image here and seeing herself as a martyr of that relationship could be. And on the right side, again, you see she is missing Diego Rivera so much that she put Diego Rivera's portrait right on her forehead oh. and called it Diego on my mind. That was the title of the painting, Diego on my mind. So literally a roller coaster ride. Um, yeah. You know, and there is actually a good movie made about that too. Uh, uh, if you ever want to check out, Salma Hayek acted uh, as 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 uh, uh, Frida Kahlo, and she got uh, nominated for Oscar. She's done an amazing job in that movie. But anyhow, coming back to this painting, see, I mean, the, and 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 the costume that she's wearing on the right side, it's a very Mexican culture uh, costume, a dress uh, specific to Mexican culture. And, and that also shows how proud uh, she is of her, in, of her heritage. Um, but the theme of that particular painting would be Diego on my mind. So is she in love with him again? <laughs> I don't know. This was done in 1943 and that one was done in 1940. So, um, but it's it's a good idea to see this and and sort of acknowledge how artists has used self portrait for so many things, variety of things, and the style, uh, like this one for example, Juan Miro, he never worked in in uh, in uh, cubism. This he was a surrealist artist, uh, but he did this as a self portrait, and uh, this was gifted to Picasso, the the pioneer, the inventor of cubism okay and and this actually is in the collection of picasso museum in barcelona um, mm -hmm. right now um, but yeah what do you think about this painting i find it very interesting actually it's, it's very psych psychological isn't it 
Yeah, and uh, there is a, a little sense of humor also. It, it gives that, it conveys that also. And But there is also a little uh, seriousness about his face. So it's it's somewhere like serious comedy. Correct, correct. Could be, yeah, yeah, of course. He's, uh, I mean... Uh, Artists have utilized self-portrait also to humor themselves too, you know, um, variety of reasons. And, and humor could be one of the element of, of this, this work. Uh, but the reason I wanted to show this particular slide was because Juan Miro is not acknowledged even remotely as a Cubist artist. But this particular work he did kind of in a Cubist fashion and gifted to the Cubist master. So... So that in that tribute. regard is kind of relevant. Why? I said a tribute to him and his style. Correct, correct. Exactly, exactly. It is. It is an homage to Picasso. Then we come to one of the uh, neo figurative style, I would say, a neo figurative uh, expressionist, surrealist painter, uh, Irish born British painter, Francis Bacon. He had a very uh, uh, different, uh, almost otherworldly way of composing paintings, uh, doing his composition. That's not seen here. Of course, this is a straight shot passport photo. Um, but I'm talking in general, his painting was compositionally very different than, you know, he had a unique style. Um, uh, Bacon's uh, thing was he never saw a painting, a theme in one painting. He always saw a theme in series. So if he came up with a series of, let's say, painting with lilies, lily, the flowers. So he would have series of lily paintings dedicated to lilies, different interpretations of it, you know. So he always saw things in, in series. That's one of the important things about, about uh, Francis Bacon. And his mm -hmm. images were very unsettling. Like this one point, case in point, it doesn't make you settle. It makes you think, what is it? It's very unsettling. Just the way he distorts things, distorts mouth, is it? It's very deformed, very almost like a clinically deformed. Um, yeah. So that 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 deformity is very unsettling uh, for a viewer. Uh, but nevertheless, it's an important. He's an important artist in 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 the history, in this journey. Uh, and now we come to the great Lucian Freud. Um, I don't know how popular this artist is in the East, but uh, he's quite well known in, in Europe. He recently passed about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, he was a, he had a double uh, celebratory status. One is that he was uh, a celebrity artist, uh, you know, like Picasso, Hussein or Raza or whoever. Um, and he also has another uh, uh, thing that he was a grandson of Sigmund Freud. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, and very idiosyncratic, uh, you know, he specialized in figurative art. And here's an important thing about him too. At the peak of the tender of the day at the time was very, everybody was doing abstraction, 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 abstraction in the 50s and 60s and uh, 40s. Uh, cubism, abstraction, cubism, abstraction, you know, abstraction was just uh, invented, uh, you know, uh, uh, around 15 uh 1915, and then everybody was doing that. At that time, he made a stand right from the very first painting that I am going to be a figurative painter. Okay. So he's always been a figurative painter since first painting onwards. Uh, he did several self-portraits actually, but this one is particularly, I wanted to show uh, for one reason that all of his self-portraits will have a strange or not strange, I would say unusual kind of gaze. He's looking on the side or up or down or somewhere. Here he's looking down. So I don't know how he arranged the mirror and all that. But the the gaze, of course, was was different, very unusual. And this communicates, this, this kind of resembles that unusuality of, of his gaze in self-portraits. Lovely. And now we come to the master uh, of abstract expressionism in America, William de Koning, my one of my favorite artists. 
uh, he is such an amazing abstract painter. I just love his work, his abstract work. I love his figurative works too. But uh, um, here is one of his self portrait that he did. Um, now, again, you have to understand this painting in the context. Now, all of those realistic and theme and Christianity and secular painting, everything, everything, all of that was done. This is a new horizon. Abstract expressionism in America. Abstract expressionism, well, you, you, one, one important thing about that you need to understand, abstract expressionism was the first, in the 40s, the first uh, international art movement that was America's own. Okay. The first time America has his its own art movement at an international level. There was a couple of other movements before that too, but that was very much based in America. It was secluded, uh, limited to America, the mainland, um, such as uh, regionalism was another movement that was only, uh, um, in fact, Jackson Pollock's teacher uh, was was part of that that movement regionalism but abstract experience was the first one to to have a, that international exposure international stand and uh, william de kooning was a very important artist uh, at the time in new york so this is his self portrait now i don't know is he holding a mirror is something be if someone behind him uh, another image another person uh, so all of those elements get challenged here is that is that depiction realistic absolutely not uh, but why did they do that why did i mean of course you have to understand that in the context what abstract expressionism is or what abstract art is so if you go deep into that that's when you will get a clearer idea of what this is um, you can't understand this without knowing what abstract art is or doing a little research on what abstract expressionism is um but yeah, it's some sense of wonder at looking at his image in the mirror. Like well, maybe he is maybe he is looking, maybe he is looking at the hand. And you know, I was just thinking, does it mean some kind of wonder? Yeah, or it could be if you look at the behind him. Let me can you see my pointer here? You can, right? Yeah. Maybe this whole thing is a canvas. You see that? Maybe that's an image over there. See that background on the canvas? Maybe he's looking in the mirror, that image. Mm. Remember what we talked about? Uh, oh, we didn't. It was last time we talked about how Rembra said, mirror is, is your master. Through mirror, you can see uh, whatever, you know, if it's a good piece or if there's any shortcomings in your painting, you look in the image, uh, look to the image in the mirror and it'll give you a correct analysis. And maybe that's what he's doing. I don't know. Um, not much is written about this. Many. His, his abstract, much, so much has written about his abstract work. A lot has written about his abstract work, but not much about this pain, this particular self-portrait. Um, and, and not much has written about this particular piece either. This one is Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock just... Um, he was he was uh, he was a lightning force in New York at the time, literally a lightning force uh, for abstract expressionism because he uh, remember every movement is has challenged things about its previous movement. Now this uh, guy uh, uh, Jackson Pollock completely challenged the tools and techniques of oil painting. He did not blend colors on palette at all. Mm -hmm. He I can imagine that he would have done a self-portrait. Like, uh, even the remotest resemblance to a face, I wouldn't have imagined he, him doing. Correct. Correct. Uh, but here's the thing, though. Where does the self-portrait end? What yeah. I'm trying to say is, what if I paint only my forehead? Mm. What if I paint my glasses that's sitting on the table? Those are my glasses. Mm -hmm. You see, could that not be a self-portrait? Mm -hmm. What if just part of my forehead, if I draw, if I paint that, if could that not be a self-portrait? I can tell it's a self-portrait, but nobody else can. But then again, the challenge is the artist has cha always challenged. Is it important that other people should know that? We are not in Renaissance. We are not in Baroque where likeness and the costume and this and that, anatomy and all that thing is important. 
Mm. You know, nobody could have done this painting, you know, uh, four or five hundred years ago. That's not possible. Yeah. I mean, they, if somebody has done this, a child has done this, they would have thrown it away. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But that's just the thing. That's why you have to understand the context. Context is very important. You know, it's kind of like if you make a shole right now, are you chamiya? Nobody will understand chamiya now. <laughs> because at that time in uh, there was a there was a there was a migration from villages to bigger cities of all the farmers. So farmers was, would understand that language. When Shole become hit in Bombay, the first Chamya kaha ja rahi samba that that avdi language that resonated mm -hmm. with with the with the people from villages who moved migrated to cities. Mm -hmm. That will not work now. See, so again, like I said, I'm just giving you an example. Context is very important. Now, again, speaking of context, this is Robert Motherwell, another contemporary of de Kooning and Jackson Pollock in New York. They would all paint Rothko and Gorky, Arshel Gorky, and many others. Uh, uh, this is his self portrait believe it or not. Yeah, I mean, this is like challenging the viewer too. That... <laughs> viewer too, yeah, you're right about that. Um, so why can't some part of it, uh, maybe what if I say I dream about a chair yesterday and I paint that chair, why that chair is not my self-portrait because it's, it was part of my dream. I'm just using that as an example. So where do you, where do you stop that? You see, again, uh, and then later on, when you look at postmodernism, postmodern, the definition of postmodern is the attitude of the artist. That's how it is defined as well as uh, whatever art can you do. So postmodernism is, is a movement where you utilize the entire history of art, all of the development and all of the movements as a menu card and select anything from that. Okay. By that rationale, postmodernism is not a stylistic designation. It's the chronological designation. Mm -hmm. See? But here I feel it's like he's challenging and uh, trying to say that you don't define who I am or how I should be or how I should look. Correct. It's like trying to break free of all. And that's and yeah. You 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 hit the nail. That's exactly what abstract expressionism was all about. It's freeing yourself from the imagery, because imagery is very constrained. Constra it constrains your uh, your thinking. If I see a palm tree. Or if I see, I don't know, a dog. So all my memories or my association with the palm trees or dog could be activated while I'm looking at that painting. And my experience of that painting might be affected based on what my memory is about that object. Correct. So you are exactly right. So it's completely freedom from that. So why can't self voted also have that similar freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, again, in the context of abstract expressionism. Now we come towards the end, the contemporary artist, this particular artist is still alive and well, a very important artist, sort of a Hussein of modern contemporary art, uh, very famous artist, uh, Gerhard Richter. A German artist, he must be what, 90, let's see, 70, 90, he's probably 92 or 93, something like that now. So, okay. uh, yeah, um, he is, he had number of different kinds of styles. He, um, he worked in photorealism. He worked in cubism a little bit. He worked, many of his works are abstract. My favorite of his is the phase of abstract art. Amazing, amazing work. A great artist. But he also did some figurative works as well. And one of his figurative work, this one is a self-portrait. When he does figurative work, and that's exactly why I uh, wanted to show this, is it's almost look like photograph, a fuzzy photograph. It's purposely done that way. It's it's not uh, it's, it is not a photograph. It could be easy mis easily misconstrued as it's a is it a photograph? 
easily misconstrued, but it's not. It's a painting and the technique he uses after he paints realistically, he goes and scrapes the paint off or brushes the paint off and makes it look fuzzy. And this is his self. So what does that tell, tell you? Where do you? Where do you go from here? Um, what is this particular image of? Why is he making that look fuzzy? Why is it important? What kind of statement he is making through that self-portrait? Is he making the statement things are unclear, fuzzy about life? Is that what he's trying to depict? Um, or even maybe he's trying to say the future itself is unclear. Unclear, exactly. The uh, you, you you hit the nail. Yes, correct. The future is unclear, and and he does look like walking. Walking in the, walking always walking is a symbol of future. You're going somewhere. So there is a trony of that. The, 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 the figure, uh, the image has a movement to it. The word trony, which uh, was invented back in Baroque and Renaissance art, that uh, anytime a figure has a movement to it or a face has a movement to it, it's called trony. So this particular piece does have his whole demeanor has that trony element, the movement element. Uh, and that movement or the walk uh, has has uh, symbolically always communicated future. Like even in art, when we uh, paint something in movement or in action, we tend to soften the edges or, uh, you know, they're not too defined. They are a little blurred out. So it's like things are moving too fast and it is too blurred for that reason. It can even you know, depict that, I, I suppose. I agree. I agree. I mean, it could be a variety of different reasons, and and it'd be nice, it'd be great to uh, do more research on uh, on Gera Richter and how he did this painting and why he did this painting and his ideas, um, you know, along with some other research, you know, uh, research of other painters. And here's a short bibliography uh, in the recording. Maybe we can keep that for a second if people want to know, um, and. Thank you. Thank you, Hina, for having me. I hope uh, I hope uh, we we got we may get a little bit something out of this lecture and learn a little bit. It was a bit. wonderful journey. It was a wonderful journey of knowing how self-portraits have evolved and how the thought process of artists also has changed over a period of time, the techniques have, how they evolved. I mean, it was a beautiful journey and I'm really glad that we took this upon us to present it with you so that, I mean, I'm now much more well informed about self-portraits and I'm sure I, our viewers also must have got a lot of insight on this subject. So thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so thank much you. for- no, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. So I would like to thank all our viewers for joining us and uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, talk and discussion on self-portraits and uh, do share your comments and feedback below and uh, we'll soon bring, about, uh, bring to you about the history of self-portraits in India. So stay tuned with us. Thank you. Bye-bye.